So Don Dodge is a developer advocate with Google, but I will let him describe, this is our, our first keynote conversation, and I want to let him describe his, his role, and, and then we'll get into questions about the indoor space, some of which will follow up on, on discussion we just had. So Don, take it away. Yes, uh, I'm Don Dodge, I work for Google, I'm a developer advocate. Uh, that means I work with developers and help them be successful using Google technologies. So when they have questions about APIs or uh, performance problems or integration things, then I try to solve those problems for them. Um, <clears throat> prior to Google, I worked at Microsoft and was a startup evangelist and did essentially the same sort of thing uh, at Microsoft. And prior to that, I did five startups. So I spent most of my career actually doing startups, uh, but most people know me from either Microsoft or Google. Okay, so um, as you know, I'm gonna challenge you on a statement that you made. You made a, a, a you, you've written a number of blog posts on this space and you're, you're, you know, you're a, an expert. Um, your, your quote was, or, or the title of one of your posts was, indoor location will be bigger than GPS or maps. And I wanna say that's a huge claim uh, back it up. Um, yeah, well, GPS doesn't work indoors, and that's where we spend all of our time. That's where commerce happens, that's where business happens. Uh, so it just makes logical sense that if you can do indoor location, that you're going to be able to do all sorts of things that are not possible with maps or GPS. So indoors is where business happens. Okay, so um, one of the questions that we didn't really get a totally satisfying answer to uh, on the last session was who's going to pay for all of this? We've got existing cameras, we've got existing Wi-Fi infrastructure, and uh, Avinash said as retailers upgrade their Wi-Fi, they're asking about precision and so on. But w who's going to shoulder the, the financial burden to deploy all these other technologies that we were talking about? Um, well, you had the same sorts of questions about Wi-Fi when it first came out, Wi-Fi hotspots. Like, who's going to pay f for all that infrastructure? And you had the same questions about cell phones and uh, internet infrastructure and all of that. Uh, the reality is that uh, technology gets paid for by the, uh, the people who use it, and, or indirectly. Uh, in the case of indoor location, I think it's going to be the venues that pay for it or the brands, or advertising. Advertising uh, is probably the most likely scenario to pay for a lot of this, uh, because there are some pretty obvious use cases for advertising uh, with indoor. So I think most of it will be funded by advertising. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit. Um, what, is that, what does that look like in your mind, in, indoor advertising? Give, give us a sort of a concrete scenario that you envision. Uh, if you're in a supermarket and you know you're in aisle six and you're in front of the spaghetti, then you can send an advertisement or a coupon in place, in time, right there. That's incredibly valuable and was not possible uh, before this technology. So the nirvana of advertising is to deliver the right message to the right audience at the right time. That's been nirvana forever, right? Right message, right audience, right time. So-called well, one-to-one now, marketing. Now you can do it in the right place. So imagine being able to deliver the right message at the right time to the right audience in the right place. That's going to change advertising in, in enormous ways that we don't yet understand. So we have a panel specifically about that scenario this afternoon called microfencing uh, in in aisle targeting, but. The current, with the current infrastructure, cameras and Wi-Fi doesn't really support that level of pre precision, if I'm correct. Right. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So what has to happen from an infrastructure standpoint before you get to that scenario that you just described? Um, let me back up just a bit. The, the slide that you had up there before about the technologies, uh, there are several important ones missing. Uh, oh. The first one is inertial sensors. And Every phone has inertial sensors in it, meaning accelerometers, gyros, uh, the one that tells you how high you are and temperatures and all this kind of stuff. Inertial sensors are huge. Uh, they're already in the phones. They are amazingly accurate and getting more and more accurate. 
so those, I think, are going to play a big part uh, going forward. The other is uh, radio frequencies. So there's ultra so, high so band. So not, not RFID and not no. acoustic? No. Okay. No. Ultra wideband, UHF. Uh, there's all kinds of different radio frequencies uh, that are unused at the moment that could be used for this and are uh, very, very accurate, very low cost. Uh, so we're going to see some of those actually come out. And then the last one I would mention is uh, small cells, FEM2 cells, um, GPS repeaters. So the cell phone towers that we have now, you can get some triangulation location from those, but imagine having uh, small cells, which are essentially like Wi-Fi hotspots, only for cellular network. Those things are starting to emerge, and when you have those, then you can get much better uh, accuracy off just off cell signal. Okay, so we have even more scenarios than you, than you than earlier described yeah. with res respect to positioning technology, but doesn't that create more noise and confusion in the market from the buyer standpoint? I mean, we've got all these different technologies and they're, they're sitting there starting to evaluate them and what should I go, you know, wh which one should I go with, which ones are going to last, what's going to deliver against sort of my longer term objectives? Doesn't doesn't this create an enormous confusion? Yes, uh, and confusion is good. Uh, that's where you opportunity arises. Uh, I, I think when they're making decisions, there are a couple of key questions they have to ask. So one decision is how important is accuracy? Do you need to be accurate to 10 meters, 3 meters, 1 meter, 1 centimeter? Is the, there such a thing, 1 centimeter? Yeah, there is. Uh, there is some other technology that can do one centimeter accuracy. Uh, I'm not able to talk about it because I'm under NDA, but it's amazing, amazing technology that can tell you within one centimeter where you are. Uh, where is the urinal in this bathroom? <laughs> that kind of scenario. No, there's some really great stuff coming. Break uh, is coming up. Oh, confusion. So um, when you're making decisions, it's accuracy versus cost. Now, some applications don't really care about accuracy. Presence is good enough. Knowing that you're in the store or in the building is good enough for the applications that they care about. So in that sense, then, you can go with a cheap technology that's readily available because uh, you don't need accuracy. Uh, others care deeply about accuracy and want to know that you're exactly in front of this product in this aisle. Uh, so depending on which way you go, how important that is to you, that's going to determine your technology So isn't choice. there some tension here between the brands or the would-be advertisers in your scenario and the retailers or the venue owners? Because my guess is that cost will trump accuracy from a venue or retailer standpoint, but the brands and the, the would-be advertisers are going to want accuracy because they'll want the option to reach people right at the point of decision on the pizza the uh, spaghetti sauce aisle. So is there some tension there, and how do you see that playing out? Well, I don't know about tension, but it does make a difference in uh, what decision you make. So let me back up again on the decision points. So it's accuracy versus cost. Another one is ubiquity versus proprietary. So do you want a technology that is ubiquitous and open to everyone, or do you want a proprietary technology that only works in your building or your store? And there are cases where uh, big retailers or uh, companies only want this app to work in their store. That's all they're interested in. So they would go a more proprietary route. Uh, the third one is infrastructure. So do you want this app to work everywhere? So if you have an app that you want to be able to walk into the Nordstrom or you want to be able to walk into Home Depot or any any building and you want it to work, well, that means that you can't be proprietary. That means you can't rely on one single technology to be there. So I think in the near term, if you care about a ubiquitous application, you're going to have to support more than all of those technologies up there because you don't know which one is going to be uh, in place in the uh, venue that you all the to. All the technology vendors, though, want, are obviously in favor of their solutions being deployed as widely as possible. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's unlikely that anybody's going to pitch a sort of an exclusive 
kind of technology scenario. I mean, is, do you disagree oh, no. with that? Yeah, I do. Uh, they're doing it all the time right now. And we're in the early days, and you have technology providers that are promoting just Wi-Fi or just Bluetooth or just inertial sensors. But they're or, promoting it as broadly as they can to, to buyers. That's what I meant. Sure, but uh, I, they are focusing on one technical approach that works, but it doesn't work in all cases. It doesn't uh, solve all application problems, or it's not cost effective. So what I'm saying is there are a variety of choices, and depending on is accuracy important or is cost important, is ubiquity important, uh, those sorts of things are going to drive your decision, and no one of those technologies solves all those questions. Okay, so back to your spaghetti sauce example. What, what is the most likely technology in your mind to be able to deliver against that in-aisle targeting, in targeting scenario? What, if you had to place a bet on one of these or the additional technologies that you mentioned, where would you place that bet? Um, if you want accuracy, then it's going to be Bluetooth sensors, or it's going to be the lights, the LED lights in the ceiling. Um, those two in particular are very, very accurate. And then the third one that I can't talk about. Uh, the is a mystery technology. A sensor type of thing. Uh, those sorts of things are incredibly accurate uh, and would be the choice if you need in aisle uh, precisely in front of a uh, product. So because Dan Ryan isn't here to argue in favor of LED on his, on his own behalf, the, the argument that I've heard in favor of LED is that retailers are going to replace their lights with LED lighting anyway because it's much more cost effective from a bulb replacement and labor standpoint. These lights just last longer. And the, the ancillary benefit or one of the benefits of them is that you can get location positioning off of them. So there's right. this sort of cost incentive to replace lights with LED and then you're going to get location. How, how, do you buy into that? Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Um, full disclosure, I'm an investor in Bite Light, so oh, okay. I well, definitely then of course buy you into that. it. Uh, but I just looked up at the lights in the ceiling here. Um, those are not, well, I can't tell if they're LED or not. I don't, I'm blinded by this I don't one. Think they are. Right but the way that the lights work is that LED lights, people are going to replace them anyway because of lower cost of operation and uh, you know, better energy use. Uh, but the way that they work is they put a little uh, chip in the light and it flashes uh, each one of them a unique flash sequence that is so fast the human eye can't see it. So uh, there's no seizures? No, it looks like a normal light. That was a serious question. But it flashes so fast that the human eye can't see it. But when you're holding your phone, there's a front-facing camera and that front-facing camera can pick up the pulses and know exactly where you are. So, like, with all of these lights here, it could tell you within a centimeter where you are. So, so you just disclosed that you're an investor in this space, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the reasons why you paid such close attention to it, beyond your interest in it uh, broadly. When you're looking at all these startups, you know, uh, Leslie talked about over 100 startups in this whole ecosystem, which is starting to coalesce. What, what are you looking for? How do you evaluate these companies? Because there's a lot of companies, a lot of claims. I mean, I've been on the phone with a lot of companies in the last several months, and they're all saying our technology is more accurate and it's cheaper and so on and so forth. What do you, what do you look for and how do you pick companies that you think are going to ultimately succeed? Uh, well, I tried to spread my bets. Uh, so my first investment was Wi-Fi Slam. Uh, that was the, it was acquired by Apple uh, earlier this year. And uh, it was clear to me when I saw Wi-Fi Slam that uh, they had a unique advantage that no one else had. Uh, and the team was from Stanford PhDs and, and they were just killing it. So uh, it was pretty obvious to me that that was a, a good bet. Uh, so 13 months after making the investment, uh, they were acquired and that got me pretty excited about this site, uh, this space. Um, then I st started to spread my bets. Uh, so I have uh, another one in Wi-Fi, I've got one in lights, uh, bite light, uh, I have one in inertial sensors, actually two investments in inertial sensors, I think that's going to be a big spot. Uh, then uh, application level, uh, so not technology oriented, but more application level. Uh, another full disclosure, I'm an investor in IL411 uh, that does in Really the whole list of speakers here at the conference, in fact. Yeah, everybody's here. <laughs> um, so. 
I look for, this is early in the game, so I'm looking for technology teams that really get it, have unique insights, or have uh, domain experience in the business and uh, with retail in particular. So I think in one of our previous conversations, you, you raised the possibility that the underlying location technology might at some point become a commodity and that there would be value created at another level in the whole sort of stack, if you will. Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate on that and, and sort of play that out in terms of how you think this will evolve and where you think the, the, the value gets created? Yeah, I think it's a good idea to just review the technology stack here for just a minute. Um, there's the chip level. So those are the sensors that are in the phone. And there's a lot of technology there from Qualcomm and Broadcom and others who are building the chipsets that go in the phone that can do location, either with sensors or uh, radio frequencies or other things. Then you pop up to the handset manufacturer level, the hardware level. Um, all of them are involved in some way uh, in indoor location. Then the next level up is the operating system. So you've got Google with Android and Apple with iPhone and Microsoft and uh, Nokia. So they all have their operating system level kinds of approaches to location. And then the technology providers on top of that, so some of which you've mentioned up here. And then the highest level is the application level. So the application level is more looking at the problem uh, for the consumer or for the end user and taking advantage of all the technology under it. So uh, there's f at least five levels to this technology stack. Okay, and then in, in, and then in terms of where you think ultimately the value is going to get created. I mean, the, yeah. the you know, so the wireless carriers, to, to use an analogy, uh, the wireless carriers were the gatekeepers of everything mobile, and they have become essentially reduced to commodity providers of bandwidth. Not quite. But almost, and the value is now at the at the hardware or the or the OS level and the application level. So make a make a sort of a similar analysis of this stack that you've just outlined. Well, uh, if you start at the lowest level, at the chip level, there's only going to be one or two players, and Qualcomm certainly and Broadcom. So there's one or two players that are going to capture all of the value at the chipset level. Uh, and as you go up the stack, you know, operating systems, there's three, four, five of those. Uh, and the technology providers, there's probably over 100 of those. And then when you get to the application level, there's going to be millions of those. So from an investor point of view, I love this market for several reasons. One is most investors do not understand indoor location and are not paying attention to it. If you talk to any Silicon Valley VC, 90% of them won't even know what this is. That's great for me. I, I love it. Uh, so it makes a great opportunity. Any VCs in the house? Okay, oh, we got one. one. All right, so he's the other guy. Two. Two guys understand beyond Doug. Yeah, well, okay. one of them's from Nokia, so they yeah. definitely know. <laughs> um, but the other thing is, there are going to be hundreds of winners in this space. So typically, when you invest in like a social thing or a consumer oriented thing, there are one or two winners and a hundred broken hearts. Their technology is good, their teams are good. But it's just the natural order of things that there's only one or two companies that win, and the other hundred are broken hearts and losers. Uh, in this case, I think there's going to be hundreds of winners because there are these different levels of the stack. There are all these vertical markets uh, where you can win. So I think there's going to be lots of winners uh, in this space, uh, which increases your odds of success. Okay, so we're going to go to questions in a minute, um, but you, you uh, obviously there's a retail use case that's, that's been discussed a little bit and we're going to get into it in much more detail. What are some of the other sort of near-term indoor location use cases that you think are partic particularly interesting? Uh, there are several. Retail is the obvious one and the, uh, the big one, but there's just standard wayfinding uh, that people use maps for today. So just finding your way around a shopping mall or airport or whatever. Uh, there's social kinds of things, friend finding. So imagine going to a concert uh, at a big concert venue or uh, going to a shopping mall and being able to find your friends. So you know that two or three of your friends are there, but you don't know where they are. So that's going to be a big um, social kind of application. Uh, security and safety, uh, knowing where people are in a, in a burning building, uh, 
when the electricity doesn't work or the lights are out or whatever, being able to, there are different security applications, uh, just knowing which people are in a building or in a room, if they're supposed to be there or not. Uh, imagine the security applications. and You don't need a security person in every single room. You can just look at the screen and know which people are in which rooms. And we're tracking all of the MAC addresses on your smartphones right now. <laughs> Advertising and coupons are obviously a huge, huge market um, that will come quickly. Uh, what about sort of ordering food from your seat in a, sporting, in a sports event? That's one of my favorite hypothetical scenarios. Yeah, so the waiter knows where to deliver the food, right. uh, the where, where you're sitting. The seasoned curly fries, for example. Indoor games is another one. So uh, video games is a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, games are moving to mobile. Now imagine if you take mobile games and, and incorporate indoor location, so things like uh, Monopoly or Risk or Tower Defense or Capture the Flag or those, that genre of games, even first-person shooter games. Imagine turning the Palace Hotel into the venue of a first-person shooter game. So games are another huge, huge market that could be... Um, yeah, and Google has, uh, Google's uh, Niantic Labs has uh, Ingress, which is an outdoor game, but it could yeah. easily move inside. And the last one I'll mention is uh, workforce tracking. So I'm sure you've been in a hospital and it says, Dr. Smith, please report to uh, the emergency room because they don't know where the doctors are. Or uh, if, if you're Boeing and you've got uh, you know, a mil 10 million square feet of space, but you don't know where your supervisors are. Or it's doctors, supervisors, specialists, all these sorts of things. So just workforce location, knowing where people are. So right there, I named off one, two, three, four, five, six, ten different uh, markets. Uh, there's opportunity for winners in each one of those and many more. Okay, let me, before we go to questions, let me ask you sort of another question about who's going to own the indoor channel. This is something that we'll talk about in more detail later this afternoon in this microfencing uh, discussion. I think there's an operating assumption that the retailers all have that they can sort of make decisions about their venues and they're going to be the ones in control of what goes on inside their venues and um, I think that that's a false assumption and I and I you know I think that there are companies for example the company you work for Facebook and others and ad networks who may find their way into this whole proposition uh, and be able to deliver ads or communication to a to a person inside of a uh, a retail venue that can be done with a geofence today so comment on that who who do you think is ultimately going to own that indoor channel? Everyone. Uh, no one company in particular. Uh, it's already the case that the retailers don't own the channel. Um, if you go into any retail store, you can see people pulling out their phones and they're surfing the web, they're price checking, showrooming, they're doing all kinds of things uh, on their phones now. Uh, so no one is going to own the channel. It's going to be available to everyone. That doesn't mean that everyone is going to be equally successful. Uh, there will be other companies that will do this extremely well and will be much more successful than others, but I think it's going to be open to anyone and no one will own it. So we see, we see a number of different things with, with retailers and their attitudes. We've got a lot of retailers that are sort of deploying this, testing this out today. Many of them are sort of publicity shy because of the Nordstrom experience. <laughs> Um, you know, I know that sort of directly and vicariously. They don't want to be cast in a, a negative light. Um, what, what would you say to retailers who may be sort of taking a wait and see approach or biding their time? I mean, do you think that there's any potential liability in hesitating uh, around embracing indoor location, or do you think that they can just sort of be fast followers and everything will work out? Fast follower is a good uh, strategy if you truly are fast, uh, but most are not. Uh, so I think the big retailers uh, that I've been working with and, and seen, every major name has an initiative uh, in indoor location. Most of them are not talking about it yet because it's a competitive advantage for them. Uh, but I think every major retailer will be uh, involved in indoor location. Uh, and it's just a question of who's going to lead and who's going to follow. So can you estimate what percentage of major U.S. retailers are now either deploying or testing this out? Question number one. Of the top 50 uh, retailers, 
I would say more than half. And of the top five, all of them. And in a year from now, what, what will those numbers look like? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I think the early leaders, the big guys, are going to pretty much uh, be the leaders, and the fast followers are going to come from behind. Uh, you know, as an example, um, the loyalty cards. Remember those things? I've had a loyalty card for 20 years at a, a supermarket, various supermarkets. Uh, they know everything I buy, every when I buy it, they know everything. And you know what they've done with that information? Almost nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. At least not that I can see. The only, only reason to have this loyalty card is so that you don't have to carry coupons. So Velasquez and Catalina, uh, they sort of got marginalized by the loyalty cards. Well, here it comes again. They're going to get marginalized again by indoor location because now you don't need the loyalty cards either because everything's on your phone. So uh, the smart uh, brands and retailers and advertisers will get involved quickly and the not so smart ones will be marginalized badly. So two addenda or caveats to what you said. Catalina is in, it has a deal with For Info where you can now target buyers of certain products, people who have bought Pampers or mm -hmm. Palmolive dish soap or whatever on a mobile device through that relationship. So that is using that sort of sales data yep. in, a, in a mobile advertising context. And, and as you know now, Data Logics, which is a loyalty card provider, data uh, aggregator, does have deals with uh, Facebook and some others, and they're yeah. trying to match ad exposures to in-store sales lift. So there is there is some stuff starting to happen around that. Absolutely, yeah. and I think they're going to be big, big winners. They have the data already, they have the relationships, they understand this business, and it's theirs to lose. Okay, questions? Questions? Okay, so first here and then here. And then there. That was Dan. So, Avid is a quote from, from UC Berkeley. Besides the accuracy and technological issues that are associated with it, I think an important issue is the user interface and the user experience. For example, with the LED lighting that you talk about, it seems very unnatural for people to point their phones to the ceiling or for them to be holding the phone in such a way that the signal of interest goes to them. The same thing with camera and taking pictures. Um, people usually want to hold the phone facing down. And so if you face it down, there's not really much information to kind of localize people. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think the introduction of like glass or other wearable technology is going to alleviate it? Or do we have to wait that long for, for this problem to get solved? Uh, first of all, you don't have to hold your phone in any unnatural way to pick up the signal. You can hold it the way you normally do, at an angle or whatever, and it's going to pick up the, the pulses. So uh, this is in the case of the lights. Uh, the, but you're right, the user interface does matter a lot. And I think that's where the pure technology provider companies are focused totally on technology and not on user interface. Or at the next level up, uh, on the application experience. They're just a technology provider. They're not an application provider. And it's the application level companies that get it. They get the user experience and how to uh, present the data to the user, how to integrate with back office systems, um, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, this is a complex problem. It's not a simple, you know, the best technology wins. There are many levels to what it takes to make this work. Okay, so over here, right here. Uh, Steve Brown from Zoss Communications. Um, so there's always a kind of a horse race between hardware and software, right? And so some of the uh, hardware infrastructure exists now to make some really neat applications. Uh, Talk about the gaps that exist now on the developer enablement front. You know, are the APIs there? Are the standards there? Uh, 
to make this uh, technology proliferate like, uh, like it should be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the biggest hurdle is being able to integrate with all the different technologies. Because you don't know when you go into a building if probably Wi-Fi is going to be available, Bluetooth may or may not be available, uh, inertial sensors will work if you have a truth point to start from. Uh, so as an application developer, builder, uh, you can't rely on just one technology because it might not be there. So you build this wonderful app for the consumer or for the customer and they walk into the venue and whoops, uh, the technology you relied on isn't there. So that's number one. Uh, I think application providers have to integrate with as many technologies as they can um, in order to make it work anywhere. Unless you're building a proprietary application for a big retailer. Uh, now, let's, as an example, let's use Walmart. Uh, Walmart may want, they have their own app on the phone, and they have their own reasons for that, and they want it to work in their store, and they don't care about it working anyplace else. They don't care if it works in a shopping mall or in a venue. Or anything. All they care about is that it works in a Walmart store. So if that's the case, then you can pick one technology and say, okay, we know this technology is in every Walmart store, so that's all we have to program for. Do, do you think that um, major retailers or big um, sort of market makers, if you will, are going, or, you know, Apple is another example, Google is another example, uh, with iBeacon, are going to establish a standard simply because their visibility and their footprint is so large? I mean, do you think de facto what Walmart adopts or what Apple does or what Google does is going to become the standard just because they can move the, the mountain? Uh, maybe initially, but not over the long term. Uh, I think initially Wi-Fi is the obvious choice because it's more widely uh, deployed. Uh, but I would also make an argument for inertial sensors that are in the phone. Uh, because then you don't depend on any particular infrastructure being in place, uh, and it would work anywhere. So if I had to bet on one approach, I'm not, by the way, but if I did, uh, I would vote on inertial sensors. Uh, because they're in every single phone, they're in all iPhones, Androids, every single smartphone has inertial sensors. You don't need infrastructure to make them work. So how do you receive the signal? I mean, what is the, what's on the other end of the inertial sensor to, to triangulate the user or locate the user? Uh, well, first of all, the, you have to have an application or a server to take the, uh, the data from the inertial sensors. Most inertial sensors work uh, from some type of truth point, and it can either be a Wi-Fi fingerprint or it can be a little beacon that you know, when you come in the store and the door's open, there's a beacon right over your head. So one little beacon gives you that truth point that allows the inertial sensors to count how many steps you took this way and to the right. Uh, so it, okay, it works Okay, so it's easily. compatible with multiple technologies then. Yeah. Okay, so uh, over here, Greg. question. Greg, over here. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Venu Pemaraju, Intel Capital. Uh, you gave some examples of enterprise indoor location uh, application like hospital, uh, but do you see enterprises adopting indoor location, number one, and what use cases do you envision for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I use the example of um, hospitals knowing where their doctors are, or retailers knowing where their managers are, or even at Google, we want to know where all of our employees are. So you can find um, people very quickly. So, yeah, I think there are enterprise applications for indoor location uh, within non-retail types of uh, enterprises. And you can, if you thought about it for a minute or so, you could probably come up with enterprise applications that could use location uh, uh, to very good effect. Uh, already there are enterprise applications that use presence to know whether you're online or offline or whether you're uh, there or not. Uh, take that two or three steps further to know not only are they online, but you know where they are. So after the break, we're going to have point inside and path intelligence, which are going to do examples of consumer and enterprise 
uh, B2B, uh, very concrete case studies. So that'll illustrate some of this a little bit. And then we'll have a, a session before lunch called Digital Analytics for the Real World, which will be a great deal about uh, the enterprise use case uh, as well. So there'll be much more information on that. So uh, Don, we're almost at the break. Um, this has been a really great discussion. What's your sort of final word of insight or advice for this audience before we go to a, go to a break? Uh, spread your bets. Uh, indoor location is going to be huge. It's going to be the biggest thing to hit um, advertising and retailing and couponing and uh, all of those things that we've ever seen. Uh, it's only been possible because of the explosion of smartphones. Uh, it's going to be gigantic and uh, get involved early, spread your bets and uh, uh, try to learn as much as you can. Okay, um, please join me in thanking Don Dodge for his excellent insight.